Well, this that this comment really applies more to tomorrow than to today for reasons that will become known in just a minute. But fiction, which we'll cover tomorrow, uh, generally speaking, we've got a lot of say in the fiction that we expose our students to. Getting some sense of what they're interested in is helpful in terms of selection of texts. Why do we have slightly less say in the nonfiction which we expose our students to? Bingo, that's right. So generally, the nonfiction is going to relate to what's going on in mathematics, what's going on in science, what's going on in social studies, and of course, in language arts, we've got a great opportunity to really collaborate with teachers of other subject areas in terms of helping students become more savvy at comprehending nonfiction, which they'll cover in other subject areas at a better level. So that's going to be our focal point today. In fact, the two texts that I brought in are based on some of the social study standards, and that has to do with actually two texts related to Babe Ruth. Okay. All right. If you hung out with me before, we read Babe Ruth before. It's a, it's a good example, I think. I wanted to share this one again, even if you hung out with me before, because A, I know that not everybody was at that meeting at Coastal Plains Reset. But secondly, I think that this example, which is a classroom example, is a really good approximation of what students find on end of grade assessments, which I'm sure you're interested in. All right. Uh, if you would like to follow along with, I actually, this is, I pushed this presentation out into something called Nearpod. Has anybody done Nearpod before? Okay. Do you all have internet access right here? Okay. All you need to do is go to nearpod.com. If you're interested, you can follow along on the screen. That's fine. If you'd like to follow along on your phone, uh, tablet, uh, laptop, computer, it, it, any of those devices are really good for following along on Nearpod. All you need to do is launch a web browser and go to nearpod.com. That's N-E-A-R-P-O-D.com. And when you get there, there's going to be a spot for you to type in a code. And there's a the code that you need to type in. Just five digits, all letters actually. And last but not least, it's going to ask you to identify yourself. I'm not going to collect any data on you, I promise. You don't have to put in your full name. Uh, you just put in whatever you want. Nickname, initials. And this is if you want to follow along on your own device. Otherwise, like I said, it should be just fine to follow along on the screen here. Your pod's really good for pushing out activities to students as well. Uh, so if you want to follow along, I think you'll get some sense of how it can be used as a teacher. All right. There we go. Uh, let's start here. Writing that we do after a reading is called text-dependent writing. It's the kind of writing that you do almost exclusively in your career. It's the kind of writing that students do almost exclusively at the university level, high school level, middle school level, and increasingly so, the elementary school level. The idea is, is that you've got to read something carefully, and then the writing question is going to ask you about some aspect of what you've read. Your job is to address whatever that question is asking you to do, but to do so using details, textual evidence from what you've read. This is something that all of you have been doing for quite a long time, even before milestones. Any response to literature 
kind of writing activity was text dependent in nature. Uh, let's briefly talk. How are your students doing on text dependent <laughs> writing? Where are they doing well? Where do they need a bit of a boost? Be more specific. In finding the evidence to support what they're saying. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And some might even comprehend the question. Mm -hmm. Oh. What is the <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. We'll talk about both of those things today. One would be making sure that you understand whatever the question is asking you to do carefully. Analyzing what is being asked of me in this question. That is, bar none, a great, great thing to talk about with students if you haven't done so already. The prompt is really a type of text. It's asking you to read that prompt. Well, you need to read that prompt carefully. My sense is that a lot of students don't read carefully enough. Why do I say that? You've seen that. Several of you are shaking your heads. Uh, what evidence do you have that they're not reading carefully enough? The prompt, that is. They're writing their deck and go along with it. I think they read it once and perceive it how they want, and then their writing sometimes doesn't coincide and correlate to what the prompt actually asks them. Yes, yes. Or Good what, what I just found is if you've modeled something prior to them writing something independently, they're going to try to make it look just like what you modeled, even if it's asking something totally different. Right. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've come across in the past few weeks. Yep. Or if they reword the question, then it's not reworded correctly. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, good pieces of evidence that maybe students aren't reading the prompt carefully enough. Um, I have tremendous empathy for students who do not read prompts carefully enough. I was notorious when I was your student's age, for not reading carefully enough. In fact, I constantly got on my report card this statement. You need to slow down. <laughs> You're moving too fast. You know what I never got, though? Let's talk about how you can slow down. It's not just a matter of saying slow down. It's a matter of let's talk about what that looks like in your own life. Okay? Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, a lot of modeling, a lot of collaboration. All right. Um, by the way, text dependent writing, of course, you know this, is the type of writing on end of grade assessments. There's no other kind of writing that third, fourth, and fifth grade kids do on that assessment. I also want to be clear, though. I think there is a time and a place for having students do writing that is not text dependent. Why do I say that? Why is it a good idea to have students do some writing that is not based on something that they've read? So that I can enjoy it. Yeah, the pure enjoyment of writing. If all we do is academic writing, and believe me, I'm all for academic writing, it's important. But sometimes it's not the most engaging kind of writing. Sometimes it's a whole lot more fun just to write a story from scratch using my own imagination. So yes, writing standards one, two, and three, that is opinion writing, informational writing, narrative writing, respectively. There's a time and a place for having students tackle those kinds of genres just using their imagination. There's no text to read first. Okay. Let's put a final point on it. On end of grade assessments, there are three main types of writing that students do. One is worth just two points, and it's called short constructive response. I kind of 
put my fingers out like this to indicate that somewhere in the ballpark of a shorter paragraph to a longer paragraph is really what you need. You do not need to write any more than that to satisfy the requirements of the assignment. Some students, when they get short constructive response worth just two points, they write and they write and they write and they write and they write. And what's the issue there, especially if you're in the context of an end of grade assessment? Time. Yeah. You're losing time. The two point variety are related to both nonfiction, which we'll cover today, and fiction which we'll cover tomorrow. Interestingly, they are not aligned to any writing standards. They're all aligned to the reading standards. These are, in other words, reading comprehension questions. So you get questions like, what's the theme of this text? Support your answer using details from the text. What's the main idea of this nonfiction text? Support your answer with details from the text. Things along those lines. Okay. The fourth point, that's the narrative. We'll talk about that one tomorrow. The seventh point, that's the multi-paragraph essay. There's just one of these. Actually, there's just one narrative as well on end of grade assessment. So, introduction, certain number of body paragraphs, conclusion. That's really what's being looked for in the seven-point essay. The seven-pointer is the last kind of writing that we're going to be talking about today. It's related to nonfiction, always. I'm sure that's review for all of you. However, I want to pause for a second. Questions about the three main types of writing that students find on not only contexts like in your class, but also on end of grade assessments. OK. Oh, let me say this. The first one, two point, and this last one, seven point, it's everywhere not just on milestones or in your class. It's absolutely everywhere. All right. um, here's a discussion question for you. This is just a little bit of what we've done up to this point. has been just a little bit of introductory material. I'm not going to do much talking anymore. You're going to be doing a lot more of the talking. So here is prompt number one. What I want you to do is with people at your table, I want you to consider this statement and talk with one another about the following. What does this statement mean for our literacy instruction? What does this statement mean for our classroom literacy instruction? Okay. We'll come back together in about a minute and share out what you talked about at your table. Okay, time. Uh, let's see. Michelle, what y'all talk about? We were just talking about how it all relates that without one, you're going to have trouble with all the rest of it. Yes, such a good point. If you have trouble with one, you're going to have trouble with all of them. 
If you have trouble with one, you're going to have trouble with all of them. And there's a flip side to that coin. If you're really succeeding with one of them, you're much likelier to do better on the others. Yeah? Michelle, great comment. Uh, let's see, Allison, what else did y'all talk about? We talked about how reading, I mean, it's hard to teach just reading and write. They're all intermingled together. So we kind of said the same thing. Yeah, good comment. It's hard just to teach one without teaching the others, right? All right, one more. Nancy, go ahead. What did y'all talk about? Um, like on our team, we teach Ashley's reading. She teaches the language arts and writing. And it's hard. We notice that it's very hard to um, have them be connected, like teach them um, when we're isolated. It's really hard to teach those skills well if they're taught in an isolated way. So, for instance, if Nancy is having her students read particular texts and Megan is having the same students write about something else entirely. It, that's, that's a missed opportunity. Does that make sense? I'm not going to nerd out on theory and research too much, but I will say this. This integrated approach where you're working the same part of the brain, when you read, when you talk about what you're reading, when you write about what you're reading, and then language, both speaking and writing, you're working the same part of the brain. These skills, reading, speaking and listening, writing, language, they're meant to be taught together. There's a really missed opportunity if they're not taught together. Therefore, we're going to take an approach today that is all about integrating these four constructs, for lack of a better term. So reading, speaking and listening. I'm just going to say talking for speaking and listening. I'm just going to say talking, okay? So reading, talking, writing, language. You have just this very simple table. It's a handout on your table that I think it says reading, writing, activity template for nonfiction. I have used this a lot when working with students as a way to make sure that I am integrating all four of those things. Reading, talking, writing, and language. Um, take a look at the table and just get a feel for how it's structured. You'll see that we don't get to the essay until the very end. But you'll get some sense of during reading, there is there are some pre-reading questions that we're asking students, or having them talk about what they already know about a particular topic. There are questions that I'm going to ask students during the reading. Those are discussion questions. One note about discussion questions, they are tied in with our reading standards. Thankfully, third, fourth, and fifth grade informational texts, the reading standards, are so similar. Isn't that great? Why is that great? <laughs> what, what, what goes together? It just builds on each other. You could kind of do it together. I mean, bounce back and forth as you teach. Yes. How would this look in non What does the good information have to say? That's right. In other words, if I'm in a third grade class at this school, or a fourth grade class at this school a year later, or a fifth grade class at that school another year later, when we read, talk, write, and do language, it feels and looks really, really similar. Think about how heartening that must be for your students. It's not like I'm reinventing the wheel. What does change, though, as kids get older? Not the standards. The standards are remain very similar. What does change, though? The text. The text themselves. Good answer. And what 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 changes? The structure. Level of difficulty. Complexity goes up. Generally speaking, the length of the text goes up. The kinds of themes that get explored become a little bit more complex. Things along those lines. You're absolutely right. But more than anything, and I know that I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but more than anything, we have such an opportunity for really tight vertical alignment 
in our instruction when it comes to literacy, which is really, really good news. Wow. I'm excited about that. So I digressed. You're talking about what you're reading. Discussion questions which are aligned to our reading standards. Then you do a little bit of writing about what you've read. That's just kind of like short, constructive response. So whenever there's reading, there's talking, and there's always writing. Always. Where does language come in during the talking and the writing? Does that make sense? Then what happens? You shift to a related text, text number two. Same thing then, when you get to text number two. Same sequence. But after you finish text number two, according to this table, what do you get? At the very end of the line, the very last activity, the essay. I'm not going to get you to the essay until we have done a lot of reading, talking about what we've read, related texts. We've done a little bit of writing about each of these texts. So by the time you get to the essay, this is not a brand new thing to you. You've got some expertise. So reading uh, an informational text and then asking the students to write an essay, that's just not in order. There's a lot more than just reading one informational text that needs to happen before, before writing a five-paragraph essay. It's a good point. And I'm not saying that it's a terrible idea to do that. Not saying that. What I am saying is that in a lot of contexts, if students are asked to write a lengthier piece on end of grade assessments, for instance, mm -hmm. there are always two texts. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other contexts, and I'm going way ahead here, but bear with me. AP exams. Some of your kids are going to take those AP courses. Mm -hmm at the high school level. The AP language exam, for instance, argumentative essay prompts carried with them seven to 10 texts. It's a lot of texts. Thankfully, they're on a common topic. So for instance, several of you are reading biblical commentaries. Commentary one, two, three, four, five on the book of Job, for instance. Your job, read those commentaries, all five of them. Think about how they're similar and different. Write an essay analyzing the similarities and differences of those five commentaries. What a cool assignment that would be. What a book, huh? Book of Joe, fascinating. I could talk about that one forever. But, that's for another day. Yes, so I, I don't think it's a bad idea to have your kids write an essay on one text. More often than not, though, on something like, end of, well, always on end of grade assessments, it's going to be two. For some other situations, it's going to be more than two that they've got to read. And when they're doing their independent practice to get ready for that, I want it to look that way. Yeah. You know? And if that's the case, then if you follow this template, it would. Yeah. And I want to say this about the template. You're going to fill it out. You're, going to, you're basically going to with team members at your table, you're going to get a sense of what this feels like to just kind of like map this all out. Reading, talking, writing, language on two related texts. Oh, by the way, we'll do the exact same thing tomorrow, except we're doing fiction rather than nonfiction. You fill these out, if you feel comfortable with them, then you're getting a really good flavor for the sequence that students follow when they're on their own. And by the way, that's the whole idea, isn't it? The whole idea is for us to simulate what students need to do on their own. Mm -hmm. The whole idea for us in the classroom is to simulate, to transfer that expertise from me to you, so that when you're on your own, you are showing some expertise. All right, let's get going. Text one. George Herman Ruth, Jr. Babe Ruth. Here's what I want you to do at your table. Um, actually, let's kind of give everybody a heads up. Um, Pre-reading. One of the, a, a, after you follow 
in the template, after you just jot down what text you're doing, the next row down asks you to map out just a few pre-reading questions for your students. I always endorse pre-reading. Why? Why do pre-reading? Background knowledge, build it. Let me pause for a second here. And, 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 is it Dixie? Did you say that? Pass it. Say your name one more time. Tammy. Tammy. Two significant factors related to reading comprehension. One, background knowledge. Two, you know what that hazard a guess. Background knowledge and one other are probably the most important factors for us as we comprehend what we're reading. Background knowledge is number one. Vocabulary. Vocabulary. Those two. Good answer. You win the prize. <laughs> What's the prize? A uh, cookie. Which I'm going to give you a cookie break, by the way. I know you're already thinking, like, come on, dude, let's get on with it. I want a cookie. I, I, who doesn't? Right? The whole point of pre reading is to build some background knowledge. We know that that's one of the most important factors of reading comprehension. Your job. I want you to just take a look at George Herman Ruth Jr., the Babe Ruth. I don't want you to read it yet. I just want you to take a glance at it. And I want you to jot down, as a team, just a few pre-reading questions that would be good to ask your kids before you all start reading this as a group. Okay, go ahead. Give you about a minute. <laughs> That we might talk about. If they had a already a prior knowledge that of who he was, then you could go deeper into what are some vocabulary words you might already we need to know to for the story, things like that. Is it fiction or is it nonfiction? Try to use some of those vocabulary words they'll see later. Yeah, I really liked what you said about. Do you think this is fiction or do you think this is nonfiction? Do you think we're going to be reading fiction here or do you think we're going to be reading nonfiction? By the way, what are some clues that would help us answer that question? Okay. We've got a picture, we've got a bunch of dates. Let me ask you this. 
What, do the dates tell you anything? You've got a bunch of dates here. What does that tell you, if anything? Happened a long time ago? Text structure. Um, talk about that. Uh, what, what, what about text structure? Yeah, it looks like we're going to have that kind of like a chronological sequence. And remind me, and I would ask this, this is a fifth grade text, I would ask this of fifth grade kids. It's always a good reminder question. What do we mean by chronological organization? Sometimes I forget. Remind me. Kind of a, 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 elaborate on that. Time order means it yeah. comes from the earliest to the most recent. Yeah, that was good. Uh, it kind of a chronological is kind of like a time order. Uh, from the earliest event all the way down to the latest event. Good. All right, any other pre-reading questions? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Dixie. Grade, we oh. would just say, Anne. We would just say, how many of you have ever played baseball? That's what can you tell me? Yes. I mean, third grade, that's where we would literally start. That's where I think I start. it's not a bad place to start at any grade level. You start more basic. That's fiction over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <that's good. laughs> okay. Yeah, anybody play baseball? Trying to get some, yeah, Tammy, good point. Trying to get some opportunity for students to relate to the text itself. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, how many paragraphs do we have here? Yeah, it's a number of them. A lot of times the text has numbered paragraphs. We don't have that here, so we can do it ourselves. This writer does not indent. So how do we know that another paragraph has begun? Yes. Kind of a skip line. Yep. Good answer, Carl. Yep. All right. Let's do this. I'm going to have us read paragraph one as a group. Then what I'm going to have you do is read paragraphs two, three, and four in small groups. Anybody want to volunteer to read paragraph number one? You're out there. Somebody who likes to read out loud. I know you exist. Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Kayla, go ahead. It's not really to talk without getting in trouble. Okay. Yeah, this is where I would raise my hand. George Herman Ruth Jr. was born February 6, 1895, and died on August 16, 1948. He was an outfielder and pitcher who played baseball from 1914 to 1935 in the Major League. He actually started his career as a left-handed pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, but is best remembered for his outstanding outfield performance with the New York Yankees. He also set many batting records, including his famous 714 home runs. He was one of the first five players to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1936. Ah, very, very good. Um, Actually, I misspoke. We're going to keep going, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to address paragraph one, and then you're going to go back and address address paragraphs two, three, and four. But I want to keep going, though. Anybody want to volunteer to read paragraph two? I will. Yeah, and go ahead. When George was seven years old, he was sent to a school for boys. He learned his baseball skills from one of the teachers at the school. Ruth was signed to play for the Baltimore Orioles in 1914, but was sold to the Red Sox in 1916. Although he was known to be an outstanding pitcher, pitcher, he wanted to be able to play every day. Because pitchers could not play every day, the coach allowed him to play as an outfielder. In 1919, he broke the single season home run record. After that season, he was sold to the New York Yankees, where he played for the next 15 years. He helped them win seven league championships and four World Series titles. He retired in 1935 after playing a short time for the Boston Braves. Fourth paragraph. Babe Ruth was a legend in baseball. His ability to hit home runs drew fans to the ballpark and helped the sport of baseball gain in popularity. Babe Ruth was a star on the ball field, but was not always successful in his personal life. Making some bad choices caused him problems in his later years of playing baseball, I mean, of playing ball. 
However, Babe Ruth also tried to inspire others off the field. He made appearances in support of veterans during World War II and accepted appearances to talk with young athletes. In 1946, Ruth was diagnosed with cancer and he died two years later. Babe Ruth is considered by many to be the greatest player of all time. Uh, Haley, thank you very much. Back to paragraph one. So we did a full read where you just kind of got the lay of the land what this thing is saying. If you're like me, you probably didn't pick up on everything. So we're going to go back and do a second read, but we're going to do a little bit of talking about each of these paragraphs. Okay, so paragraph one. Here's a question that I would like you and your teammates at your table to answer. Just paragraph one. What, what do you think the main idea of paragraph one is? And then what details support your understanding of that main idea. So that's what I want you and your teammates to discuss. What do you think the main idea of paragraph one is? And then what details did you get in that paragraph that makes you think, yep, that's the main idea of paragraph one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 